Okay. Well, uh, yeah, uh, let me start by thanking Sergey and uh, Pete for inviting me to give this seminar and uh, also thank Pete for his uh, extremely kind uh, introduction. Uh, was that me? Uh, I guess so. Um, okay, so here's my title. And uh, I should just add that at the end, I will show a few slides uh, summarizing our teaching module, what I'm calling the discovery of animal culture, which is now a kind of 70 years uh, story, I think. And then uh, that's going to be relatively brief. And then for the rest of the talk, I will focus on what I'm calling the reach of uh, animal culture. <clears throat> So the discovery of animal culture, I think whenever we talk about animal culture, we always have the, the, as a reference uh, human culture. And I don't really need to uh, persuade members of the Cultural Evolution Society about um, the reach of culture in our own species. But uh, I would say around the middle of the last century, it was generally thought that culture was a unique attribute of our own species. And I'm going to illustrate that with a couple of things. First of all, a quotation from uh, the eminent Sir Peter Medawar, a Nobel laureate, wonderful popular writer. And here is what he said in uh, a, a book review in 1977. So we're already a little past the middle of the century. Um, well, human beings owe their biological supremacy. I mean, we do dominate the planet to the possession of a form of inheritance quite unlike that of other animals exogenetic or exosomatic inheritance. And he went on to explain in this form of heredity, information is transmitted from one generation to the next through non-genetic inheritance, in general by the entire apparatus of culture. So he's saying that this, this amazing thing of non-genetic inheritance is really what uh, is quite unlike that of other animals. And I hope to persuade you differently. One of my contributions to this field that uh, Pete already mentioned uh, was this paper, which I'll talk in a little bit more detail about later on. But for the moment, uh, let me just say that what we concluded was that uh, chimpanzees, wild chimpanzees, have uh, a number of different traditions, 39 we identified in this, uh, in this study across Africa. And those panels at the top left that I'll come back to uh, are meant to illustrate that. Well, this paper created a tremendous impact uh, in the popular media, newspapers and so on around the world. And I was contacted by uh, a colleague in the US to say, wow, Andy, your research is on the front page of the New York Times. Now the whole world knows about your research, uh, which if, if you'll forgive me, sounds maybe a bit American view of the world. Uh, but anyhow, um, it was true because uh, here on the left is, is what was on the front page. And then there was all that inside written by this excellent journalist, Natalie Angier. And, um, you know, I think it's difficult nowadays to imagine seeing that much newsprint devoted to almost any scientific story. So that was great. But what was more extraordinary was that there was an editorial in the New York Times. And indeed, there was also an editorial in our, our uh, big broadsheet paper in the UK, the Daily Telegraph. But the New York Times one said that um, after examining the results of 151 years of chimpanzee research, a team of primatologists recently concluded that certain behavioral variations among groups of chimpanzees could only be called cultural. Yeah. But then it went on later. The case of the cultural chimpanzees is, for some people, particularly troubling because it blurs a boundary that seemed especially clear cut, almost sacred. Whenever it's suggested that evolution has played a critical part in shaping the details of human behavior, controversy erupts. I'm sure several in the audience are aware of that. Uh, we like to believe instead that culture, the arena of our freedom, according to the New York Times, is the main determinant of human behavior. The faith that cultural variation is unique to humans has perhaps softened the theory of evolution, you know, that dangerous theory we all know about, uh, for some because it seemed to suggest that humans were liberated in a behavioral, if not a biological sense from evolution's rigor. Um, an amazing editorial, you probably agree. 
Um, and so what they were saying was that what we discovered was about something that was believed to be a solely human attribute. Well, I would say that the New York Times by now was in a way already about 50 years out of date. Why? Because we can trace the origins of the field to um, certain foundations. I'm going to mention three. The, these are probably quite well known about, but let me just quickly run through them. One was these beautiful studies of uh, blue tits and grey tits in the UK, who started uh, approaching milk bottles, uh, peeling or, or pecking off the tops to get at the cream underneath. And James Fisher and Robert Hind collected the data from British birds journals over the years to show that this had originated in one centre down in the south of England, in another in the north, and then over around 12 years, it had spread across to the whole of the UK. And you can't really explain that through genetic change or uh, there were milk bottles everywhere, so probably not the environment. And another example comes from Birdsong, who's played a big part in this. So studies by people like Bill Thorpe in Cambridge compared uh, the songs of wild type chaffinches reared with uh, other chaffinches and hearing their songs with the songs, and here's a spectrograph for um, an isolate bird who's not heard any other songs and it doesn't produce this, this uh, three part hierarchically structured song with a special terminal flourish at the end. We simply don't see that in an isolate bird. And if you couple that with uh, the first evidence um, from researchers like Peter Mahler, I'm here illustrating the, the, the topic with a, a later paper, uh, which I think shows rather nicely that um, birds in, in different parts of the country sing kind of the same song, but uh, with different dialects, uh, just as of course, you know, we know people talk with different dialects in different regions as well. And a recent, uh, relatively recent book was already able to reference about 84 different studies of bird song dialects, a uh, major, uh, an array of studies, and many birds are songbirds. So this may be really quite common. And then of course, the third one, probably quite well known, is uh, Japanese macaques that were provisioned with uh, sweet potatoes on the beach. They got sandy and gritty, of course. And then one juvenile female started washing them in a stream. Well, if we put uh, a monkey like Emo, uh, well, a monkey like that into Emo's position in her family, well, all those uh, monkey names with a rectangle around them are the monkeys that later picked up this behavior, first spreading amongst her peers and her own family, and then to these other families too. So we have these three foundations, I would say, and that's going back 70 years. Through the rest of the century, the 20th century, um, apes came to play a, a more significant role. And I think it uh, begins to be illustrated by this uh, extract from Jane, book, Jane uh, Goodall's 1986 book, where she tabulated what were emerging as behavioral differences between chimpanzees here at five different sites across Africa. And as the information built up, other people started tabulating these X's showing what happens, the blanks indicating, no, not there. These are my scribbles uh, on it from, from my own copy of uh, Bill McGrew's Chimpanzee Material Culture. So that was rather intriguing, but it was all based on the published literature. And I think there are three major limitations I felt there. For one thing, not every observation is published, so it was incomplete. And even when it was reported, frequency often wasn't recorded. We really need to know, you know, is this a common customary behavior locally uh, or what? And in particular, at the opposite end, are behaviors truly absent? Well, I think we know, those of us who might be primatologists watching or <laughs> any field researchers, you're not really going to make your career by publishing a list of things I haven't seen. Uh, at my field site. So what I decided to do was try and engineer a prospective study and I did that by managing to get on board all the leaders of the long-term study sites which together produced this 150 years of data uh, which the New York Times mentioned. So this, this was this paper which then took a, a two-phase approach. So we first of all got each group to suggest potential cultural variants, behaviors that they knew were common at their own location and they'd heard were perhaps absent uh, elsewhere or the other way around. And that gave us a list of 
65 candidates. Um, and having defined those clearly and we got agreed definitions, each group could then classify them as, well, are they customarily done by pretty much everybody locally or at least habitual, done repeatedly by several individuals consistent with social learning? It could be that all adult males do this behavior, for example. Or at the other extreme, are they absent? With or most interestingly, without any environmental or ecological explanation we could detect. And so we ended up uh, isolating 39 behaviours that met the criteria of being very common at one place and yet absent at another, so far as we could see with any, out, any obvious environmental or genetic explanation. That's what gave us our, our 39 cultural variants or traditions. And those panels represent the 39 possibilities for each of those long-term study sites. Uh, they lit up as squares if the customary circles, if, if they're habitual, and just grey circles if they're absent. The little no entry signs means, well, the materials aren't available locally, so let's not look at that. And I think two main conclusions from this study. One is that chimpanzees have multiple and quite diverse traditions. So this went far beyond those early studies that really each showed one tradition or one instance of social learning. And these, as I say, were diverse. They covered pretty much the whole range of, of chimpanzee behavior. The other conclusion that I think I, I found was, was exciting was that if you look at each of these panels and think of them as like a kind of patchwork quilt, you could probably see that each one is unique, in fact, so that if you watch a chimpanzee for long enough, tick off a few behaviors, you can tell where that chimpanzee came from on the basis of its cultural profile, which of course is pretty much what we do for humans. If you watch particularly a tradition of someone from a traditional society, you can record, you know, what they're, what they're eating, how they're preparing it, the kind of tools or, or weapons they might be using, their architecture, their clothing, how they communicate. You could probably make a good guess at where they've actually come from. Well, this was saying so for chimpanzees. So, uh, so far so good with that, but of course that was all based on observational evidence. Um, and uh, we, we, there's always a question there about, well, can you be sure that these are actually acquired by social learning? You see the young watch closely and then pick up the behavior, but can we be sure? So I complemented uh, these studies with uh, a series of experiments that we then started doing with captive animals, captive chimpanzees. I've now later managed to get back to the field and do some field studies, field experiments. Um, but uh, these were some of the other experiments that Pete uh, kindly mentioned. This was our first attempt at what we came to call diffusion studies or transmission experiments. And so here we have two groups of chimpanzees. They're the circles and we present them all with the same problem. Uh, we called it the pan pipes because there's one pipe and then another lower pipe. And I designed these, you know, having been a field researcher, to be rather like the kind of problems that chimpanzees would face in the wild. There's some food they would really like to get, but they can't get it unless they use a, a tool. This is outside their mesh. Well, we take one chimpanzee aside and teach it or train it that you can use a stick tool to push through your mesh, lift the blockage up out the way, and then the grape rolls down and they get it. But you can see here a little flap. In this group, we're going to take one individual out, just one, and uh, train it that you can poke your stick right in here, push the blockage back, knock the grape off the back, so you get the grape that way. So now we have two experts, each of which can solve this problem, but in a different way. We also had a third group, a control group with no model, and they didn't solve it. Neither of these behaviors come particularly easily to chimpanzees. Pushing food away from you, for example, and lifting is, is not something chimpanzees naturally use stick tools for. So then we reunite that one expert with the rest of her community, and we call this an open diffusion experiment. It's open to the chimpanzees if anybody comes and watches, who watches, and then who has a go. And of course the question is, do those two seeded behaviors spread differentially to start forming an incipient tradition? And uh, well, to, to summarize, yes, they did. But before I show you those uh, results and having introduced the general concept, let me take you on to one slightly more complicated experiment of this kind. Will tradition spread from group to group, which of course is what we're uh, uh, um, 
Well, concluding has happened in Africa with something like nutcracking in, in chimpanzees spread across a small area of West Africa, but not elsewhere, but across uh, many, many different communities. So uh, luckily, we were working now in Texas at a big chimpanzee uh, research facility where there are three groups of chimpanzees who can see their neighbors through big windows. You can probably see the windows out here at the back. And here are three other groups who can also see their neighbors through windows, but they can't see the other three groups. And as with the panpipe study, we have the same task they're all presented with, but we show just one chimpanzee who's over here how to uh, get the food out by opening a hatch here and stabbing the stick in, pulling the food out. Whereas over here, we show one chimpanzee the very different way of opening a hatch here, sliding a different tool in and pushing the food out of the tunnel. So over here, oh, and then uh, having done that, then we reunite that, that model with the rest of their group. When half the group have, have managed it, however they're doing it, we put it here so that this group can watch through their window. Then it comes here so they can have a go. When half of them are doing it, we move it here. Because by now, it may be that all the chimpanzees are doing the same. I mean, that's, that's our question, really. Do they or don't they? Then it moves here. And finally, we see what this group does given what we seeded in that single chimpanzee over here. And then we contrast that with what happens in this triplet of groups. So here's the first model, this one being very active, the scale there's 100, this one slightly less so, doing 50 behaviors before others watched. And let's run the sequence. Well, in the first group, there's already uh, a, 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 the incipient tradition forming, a highly significant difference, obviously. However, note there is one chimpanzee here who works out for herself that you could do it the other way. And that's the stab way, which might be, as it were, closer to the surface in, in chimpanzees. Um, and so we might think when we run the whole sequence, well, that kind of corruption will take over and they'll all learn to do the same thing. But to the contrary, if we run the whole sequence, no, uh, look at this group here. They're all doing and only doing the, the behavior we seeded here and was the most common all the way along. There were some perturbations or corruptions, but uh, somehow chimpanzee behavior, the, their propensities rode over those, interestingly. So we end up uh, with, with these patterns in the third group. And if you just remember those data and I present them in a different way, each block being chimpanzee there. I can do that because we can add to this probing task, another one we call return, um, uh, which is rather more complicated. I'm not going to go into the details of it, but you can see it replicated the result uh, with the blue and the green spreading. And now because we've got two traditions, um, we're calling these uh, cultures. Uh, in this case, taking minimal criterion for culture being uh, having multiple traditions, or at least two in this case. Uh, but to add we can add to that um, results from working at the Yerkes Center as well. Here are the results for the panpipes. This group seeded with poke, and they're all doing poke. This group seeded with uh, the lift technique, uh, perhaps not so conducive for chimpanzees, but most of them nevertheless picking up the lift technique and just a few corruptions along the way. So here we've got the formation of what we're calling multiple tradition cultures, where we know for sure that these are um, transmitted by social learning because of controlled experiments here um, and uh, that chimpanzees can sustain traditions of this kind at least for a few weeks the kind of period we did these studies for but then I can link that back to the wild to ask well I wonder how long such processes could go on well here's Christoph Bursch the leader of the Thai forest uh, research uh, projects going on for decades and these chimpanzees do this amazing behavior of using stone hammers and stone elbows to crack nuts open but it seems according to this archaeological excavation that's what they were doing also 4,300 years ago um, and uh, yes I mean this is quite a, <laughs> uh, an, an amazing long-term record it's perhaps difficult to think of human uh, cultures that um, you know have lasted over the last 4,300 years uh, with so little change. Interesting if we start asking questions about the fidelity uh, of animal versus human cultures. Well um, I'm really just taking you uh, in, in this uh, story about 
uh, the discovery of animal culture. I was really wanting to take you to the turn of the century. I mean, soon after our 99 paper, uh, Carol van Schaik and his group of orangutan researchers came up with a rather similar story for orangutans, a couple of dozen uh, different uh, cultural variants. They've simply extended that uh, to over 30. And then finally, just a few years ago, the gorilla researchers uh, got their act together, formed a consortium and came up with a similar story for gorillas. But I've really been trying to tell you the story up to around the turn of the century for um, the apes. And um, I hope you'll agree that perhaps we've come some way from the kind of view of the world that we saw uh, illustrated in the New York Times, uh, even in 1999. Interestingly, there's a new book come out, which I, I've, I've just kind of glimpsed uh, in, in a colleague's hands, yet to read. Um, but this is telling the longer term story, I think, of the controversies about, uh, well, do chimpanzees have culture? Uh, what does that mean? What are the implications for human culture and the various debates that have gone on within primatology, between primatology, uh, between science and uh, perhaps less scientific approaches in, in cultural anthropology and so on. Um, I look forward to reading that. Okay, so uh, that's a quick skate through what I'm calling the discovery of animal culture. And of course, it's, it's a bigger story than that. So uh, but I, I've tried to give you a, a, a sort of appreciation of roughly what, what might have happened. Because then in this century, as, as Pete also said, things have really taken off and that's what I mean by the reach of animal culture that we're now uh, increasingly discovering. So uh, starting from there uh, we've got studies uh, well just kind of indicated by these uh, images um, throwing up here and I want to run just through a few of these as, as illustrations. Let's start uh, with that one on the cetaceans, whales and dolphins. This book, uh, I think rather wonderful book by Hal Whitehead and Luke Rendell, who are both lecturers on our, our teaching module. Uh, all I'm going to do is, is give you their summary, their summary statement or the statement I've picked out as their summary, I hope they don't mind. Um, culture, we believe, is a major part of what the whales are. I think they're essentially saying here that culture is so pervading, they believe in, in cetacean life, that these animals would be very different animals, different kinds of animals without that. And they're able to substantiate that with 70 articles in their reference list actually talking about cultural transmission or social learning in cetaceans, something we knew, I, I think, next to nothing about in the last century. So things have really blossomed. Uh, just to give you a couple of uh, examples, so you're probably going to hear some of this in the background if, if this works. Um, Cetaceans songs uh, can be complicated. Humpback whale songs, for example, of which you're just seeing some elements here and some of the themes that they combine into songs. To be fully described, you have to have five hierarchical levels. And these songs uh, change every few years. You get new songs uh, appearing. And when new songs do appear, they spread fairly rapidly to very large populations at a rate you know, which couldn't be anything to do with genetic change uh, or it's difficult to see any environmental explanation. And here's one extraordinary uh, particular study of this from uh, Ellen Garland, who like Luke Rendell, uh, is a colleague of mine in, in St Andrews now, um, and uh, it concerns the, the songs of humpback whales that start uh, as new songs, what they call revolutionary new songs over on the east coast of Australia, and then over a period of years, uh, thread across the Pacific to, to French Polynesia. And they're so different that Ellen and colleagues were able to color code them. So here's the blue song going across, and then if we run the sequence, here's the maroon sequence going across behind it, and then the red sequence, then the yellow sequence, and so on. I think nobody knows, don't ask me, <laughs> why they go in that direction, um, but it's an extraordinary uh, discovery, I think. And here's another example, migration. Many uh, whales migrate halfway around the world between their breeding grounds and then their feeding grounds. And on the first migration, young like this go with their mother, essentially. And they follow her along that route. And that then seems to lay down that route for uh, the remainder of their lives, generally. 
And of course that diagram could also be drawn for migratory birds. So if we swing back to birds now, um, well, the same story applies there. That's to say young typically go with their parents uh, on the first trip and then that lays down a route they follow subsequently. At least that's true for most birds we think, but uh, of course we know there are some that's not true uh, of cuckoos, uh, can't do that. And yet some migrate quite successfully. They have something in their heads um, that tells them which way to go and, and how they know when they've got there to, in some way. Um, so it would be nice to have experiments like the kind of experiments I was doing. Difficult with whales, um, but perhaps with birds to really check that birds who are following their parents, that is the, the social learning basis of, of the, the migration paths they pick up. And through a fluke almost of conservation efforts, we have that um, through <coughs> um, these uh, efforts to uh, take cranes, uh, cranes, geese, swans, and um, imprint them on microlite aircraft. The microlite aircraft then act as sort of surrogate parents, the birds will follow them, and that can be used to lay down new migratory paths amongst populations who've lost that capacity. Um, here's just one other example from birds to swing from migration to foraging. Because I've talked about migration and uh, vocalizations in both cetaceans and birds, two very distantly related uh, groups of animals, of course, something we don't see. Uh, in primates, but we see culture in different forms, but also uh, in these other species. Um, there's a diversity of species worth identifying and a diversity of domains of behavior. So in this lovely study by Lucy Aplin and colleagues, um, in which they have hundreds of great tits marked in, in, in woods near Oxford, so that when the, the bird comes to a feeder like this, the computer knows uh, who it is. And um, what they did was to train uh, just two of these uh, birds uh, in each of, of several communities to either push this feeding device from the blue side to the right or the pink side to the left. And then others could watch. And rather like in our chimpanzee studies, yes, incipient traditions take off. Here they are mapping them uh, for those seeded with blue and, and, or red. Um, and the green ones are control birds who later did work it out for themselves, but of course are, are behind. But the fidelity involved here is quite extraordinary. So here are the two communities uh, seeded with pushing the blue side to the right, and here, the, here are three seeded with pushing the pink side to the other side. And these represent seasons. So first season, then the second season, first season and second season. And look, in the second season, they're pretty much all just doing what was seeded right at the start in these two birds pushing this pink side to the left. Something you think might corrupt rather easily. Okay, what next? Well, that's, uh, that's all for birds and mammals. Of just a quick skating over some of the, the vast amounts of evidence now. Um, the fish as well come into the story. And this is my only fish slide. Apologies to fish mythologists, but um, here's uh, some, some reef fish, and a quote from Kevin Leyland and Will Hoppit in this article, there's better evidence for culture in fish than primates. Um, and Kevin said this at a time when he was just moving up from Cambridge to join our, our community in St Andrews, which didn't make him all that popular with, with some of the primatologists, I think. Um, but nevertheless, uh, Kevin and Will were correct in the sense that uh, with animals like these, small, small fish, you can actually even catch a whole shoal and move them around the reef. And you can do all kinds of similar experiments with, with individuals or groups in, in captivity as well. And through these show what was shown that, uh, for example, they will learn the routes to follow through the reef and stick to them. Uh, I recall in one study, I think over at least 12 years, having uh, once a new tradition was set. So that's fish um, and that's all for vertebrates because perhaps some of the most extraordinary discoveries and surprising is that we're also now talking about insects. And I'm just going to give you one example from uh, two different species, uh, which are amongst my, my favorites. Um, one is for bumblebees uh, from last Chitka's group. Here's a bumblebee 
uh, that has been trained to pull this string, pull out this artificial flower, and therefore get a, the, the sweet material in the middle here. Uh, it scrabbles at the string to do that. And in these diagrams here, in these three um, hives, as it were, uh, that train B is the yellow one. So again, similar idea to some of these cultural diffusion experiments, the orange bees then mark all of those, and the, these, this shows the social network, all of the, uh, the bees who later were able to watch this bee and then started to do the behavior, which as we can see, doesn't happen in these three control hives without a model. But more surprising perhaps, uh, there are some bees marked with a, a red point or a blue point the red ones are learning not from that original bee, but from one of the other ones who had learned from the first bee. And the blue ones are learning from them. So uh, we can enumerate really uh, the, the steps here. We might even call them cultural generations. Uh, transmission uh, or diffusion from one individual to another, to another, to another. Hence, cultural transmission in the title there in a refereed journal. And then perhaps even more surprising, uh, how far can we go? Fruit flies, Drosophila, the, the darlings of the genetic laboratory, uh, studied by Etienne Danchin and Sabine Noble and own colleagues uh, about mate choice. So mate choice copying is shown here. So here we've got a male who's been dusted green by the experimenters mating with a female and the poor old pink dusted male isn't getting a look in. Watching are to observe females, and mate choice copying refers to the fact that if we later test these females, give them a choice, um, they will, in this experiment, prefer the green dusted male or pink uh, in, in the counter, counterbalance design. Uh, but these authors then went one step further because these females, their behavior towards males then became something that other females could watch and then they became the models for another series. And so here we've got, again, one of these diffusion chains, um, uh, which went over eight steps, quite extraordinary. So I think that's my quick uh, gallop through some examples from all of these studies across the animal kingdom. Um, so that in my section of the talk, I'm calling the reach of animal culture, that's the first of Five, session, five sections <clears throat> in which um, the main claim is about the phylogenetic reaches being demonstrated. The second one, uh, which might even call psychological reach or has aspects of psychological reach to it, is the pervasiveness within species and through the lifetime. Erica van der Waal and I recently published this review uh, of social learning in primate lifetime development um, and uh, we're distinguishing three phases. One phase uh, is that in which infants are spending a lot of time with their mothers. I mean, in primates, uh, the mothers are the ones lactating, feeding them and carrying them around. And this relationship is a tight one amongst mother and infant for years in great apes. So it can be eight years in orangutans. And so the infant uh, learns much of what it does learn socially from the mother in that phase, what to eat, what to avoid, um, uh, how to use tools and, and so on, perhaps in the case of chimpanzees. But then there's a second phase as the social network expands, which happens to varying extents in primates, uh, more can be learned from others. And this is perhaps particularly important, for example, in dimorphic species like gorillas, where adult male gorillas, because of their size, could have a somewhat different e ecology, inhabit a different ecological niche to uh, a youngster's mother. So there's only so much you can learn from your mother. And then at a later stage, you might want to apprentice yourself to an adult male. And there's evidence for that, not only in, in apes, but also uh, in monkeys uh, like capuchins. So that's phase two. Phase three I can illustrate uh, from a study we initially set out uh, as, as a test for phase one, which hasn't really been experimentally demonstrated in the wild, I think, until we did this. Um, oh, no, wait a minute, I've jumped ahead too much. I wanted to insert here a kind of a, a sidestep, just to point out this uh, rather controversial paper recently from Caroline Schuppe and Carol Van Schaik, suggesting that perhaps we've only seen the tip of the iceberg of animal culture through the kind of approaches 
that have been used so far to enumerate or, or, or estimate the extent of, of the reach of culture in a species, which has very much base, been based on the approach I talked about in our original chimpanzee uh, comparisons, what's common somewhere, what's absent somewhere else. Uh, but can we set aside environmental explanations for that? But of course, that then rather sets aside a lot of behavior that might be interestingly adaptive to local ecologies, uh, which of course we know is the case in, in human cultures. And so what they have suggested is that we take a different approach and it focuses on this behavior. We see here very evidently in, in young apes like this orangutan, uh, that they've labelled peering, uh, and that's exactly what it is. The youngster comes very close and peers closely to something that's going on. And in a previous paper, they established, I think it was six different contexts, or was it more, um, in which, if you record that, it then predicts what the, the youngster is, is likely to do next. For example, you know, if, they're, if they're watching tool use, then that's what they go and try and experiment with. If they watch nest building, they go and start trying to build a nest. And their suggestion is that um, we can use that then as a kind of index for the scope of, of cultural learning in, in animals like this. And when they do that with one of their orangutan communities, they've done it with two, one of them uh, holds the record of 195 different contexts in which uh, they, they record peering. And so they're concluding that much of what a, a youngster learns really uh, 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 enumerated in that way is via social learning. Well, that's controversial because, uh, you know, does all peering imply social learning? I, I think perhaps not necessarily, but nevertheless, this is um, a really interesting uh, idea that they, they've lobbed into this field. So uh, now onto phase three and the study um, that uh, I, I joined Erica van der Baal and her group studying wild vervet monkeys in South Africa. And in this study, we really set out, as I said, to, to test what happens in this phase one, um, because uh, these monkeys every month get a, a food provision which enables certain measures to be made of them. What we did in this experiment was divide it into two and uh, dye some of it pink, some of it blue. One of those we made taste absolutely horrible so that just after a few exposures, we have two groups who eat the blue but ignore the pink and two groups who eat pink and ignore pretty much ignore the blue. Um, and we did that at a stage when the infants uh, were being suckled and not taking solid food so that later we present these materials again but without any distasteful uh, addition. So both are equally edible and um, both uh, e equally tasty but um, uh, what we're interested in is whether the naive infants who now start to take solid food, what will they do? And we found that 27 of 27 infants took what their mothers and indeed most of the rest of the group uh, were focusing on. You can see this little guy, he just sits on the blue, uses it as a seat to eat the pink. But phase three, uh, we were able to uh, get a, a handle on because by fluke, uh, 10 males moved like these guys here from a group where in this case, uh, they've been in a group where everyone's eating pink, everyone knows the blue is horrible. They move into a group, look around and see, well, everyone's eating blue. Um, what, you know, what would you do <laughs> if you were one of those males? Or uh, what, what do you think they would do? Well, to our surprise, nine of the 10 really quickly switched to eating uh, the local preference. Um, as we might say colloquially, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. And so the point about phase three is when animals do uh, disperse like this into new uh, areas, uh, they may have new things to learn about the ecology, they may have new things to learn about the social dynamics in their group, and probably the best way to learn that is to do as the Romans do, what, watch what others do. So we think therefore this may be quite uh, th these kind of processes can be quite pervasive, not just in the juvenile period when perhaps a lot of it happens, as in children, uh, but in various reasons uh, through the lifetime. And I think that quote from uh, Hal and Luke uh, rather uh, jibes with that, fits in with it. And if across a number of species and number of studies, we list all the different contexts, behavioral contexts, in which there's been evidence of social learning and cultural transmission, well, uh, it's a long list and covers many of the behaviors one can really 
think of. So that's what I want to say about pervasiveness within species. Um, and then more briefly, uh, I've got three other bits to go through here. Implications for evolutionary biology at large, I think are, are fascinating. And I think that we can pretty much divide them into two. One, we're familiar to all members of the Cultural Evolution Society. Once we've got uh, what I've called a second inheritance system, social learning built on the back of the primary genetic one, where we've got the possibility of a new form of evolution, cultural evolution. Um, do we see that in animals? Well, certainly if we talk about cultural change, there's quite a lot of uh, evidence. <clears throat> As uh, Pete mentioned, I've written this recent review, Cultural Evolution in Animals, challenging title. And one of my uh, illustrations of this comes from this nice study by Heather Williams uh, and co on birdsong again, because over 30 years they were able to establish there were changes in the songs of, of birds and they tracked them over these years. Uh, but their suggestion is that you can uh, divide the process of going on here into three evolutionary processes. One is just mutation and drift, the, 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 the counterpart to uh, biological, uh, the, the, the organic version as well, which we know of as mutation and drift. So through by imperfect copying over, over time and perhaps over space as well, uh, the songs uh, drift. And they attributed this because they couldn't find any consistent direction in the drift, um, nor any relationship to reproductive success. By contrast, in directional selection, they had instances where behavior changed in a consistent direction, They're the, the things marked in green, and they found these were actually related to reproductive success. They actually had measures of fledging success that were predicted by these particular elements of the song. And then finally, the part, there are some parts of the song that really stayed more stable than you'd expect, either through even drift or directional selection. And so they suggested that some are subject to stabilizing selection. Perhaps they're things that are important to be able to, for, the, for the birds to be able to say, I'm a savannah sparrow. I mean, that, that's the speculation. So that's just an illustration of possible forms of, of cultural evolution and, and birdsong has made, made major contributions here. The other way of, uh, in which there are in, implications of evolution of biology is of course dear old uh, gene culture uh, co-evolution or culture gene co-evolution. So it's nice to have Pete uh, introducing me here for people who are in the cultural evolution society I don't need to say much about you know examples like this of uh, the culture of, of um, dairy farming um, then becoming linked to uh, lactose tolerance or intolerance where, where you don't find that. Um, but in the case of animal culture, Hal Whitehead has really led the charge here, starting to suggest there are signs of gene culture co-evolution in cetaceans. Um, and more recently, uh, some of us have joined forces with him to more generally survey the evidence for animals. So uh, this review covers birds, and mammals and we find various bits and pieces of evidence some of it's quite patchy uh, but it seems to be there and we wanted to draw attention to it so that's another i think exciting development implications for evolutionary biology implications for human evolution again i'm just going to somewhat kind of wave my hands here um, and uh, make the point that well if we think about the anatomy of uh, the, this closely related group, the great apes, including ourselves, um, we do share characteristics of anatomy such that it's not so difficult to actually recreate what our common ancestor with chimpanzees might have looked like, and indeed the common ancestor of all the great apes. That's what Richard Dawkins did in The Ancestor's Tale, for example. And I think if we're talking about psychological characteristics or, you know, or culture, cultural phenomena, we can basically do the same thing and we should do the same thing. That's to say we shouldn't take, say, chimpanzees as a kind of surrogate uh, image of our ancestor. Uh, that would be wrong. But to see what characteristics are shared and then attribute to common ancestry is a way of uncovering our evolutionary past. So I'm just going to give, show you one uh, horrible illustration. By horrible, I, I mean that uh, I'm not going to go through any, any detail here. Um, 
But uh, in this, this paper, and then you see another version of it uh, in this more recent review, um, I end up listing the shared features that I'm inferring from the whole variety of studies done. They fall into three major groups, the, the way in which traditions are, are patterned in time and space, like, like those I showed for chimpanzees, uh, the social learning processes underlying these, and even the cultural content of, of the behavior. So a certain degree of, of tool use, for example, uh, shared between ourselves and, and chimpanzees. Of course, how us go much further? Indeed, in this column here, where I've tried to, I thought it was only right to say, well, what's distinctive in humans? It almost becomes silly because we can say, you know, how many traditions in chimpanzees? Well, we've got at least 39. How many traditions do, do humans have? You know, and it, it's actually countless. Um, but anyway, that's the exercise I, I think we, we can pursue there. And then finally, I'm drawing to the end now, I wanted to just mention a bit about the practical implications, in this case, practical implications for conservation of what we're discovering about animal culture. I was delighted when just a few years ago, I was approached, as were others, by a branch of the United Nations, uh, United Nations Environment Programme, who, having sort of assimilated some of all this research, was saying, well, perhaps this has real serious implications for uh, potential policies and practices in, in conservation. They grew, to, grew together an expert working group. You see some of the people who, who've been mentioned. Here's Lucy Appling, here's Helen Garland, and so on. Um, and we met in Parma in Italy, were put to hard work for three days, wrote a report at the end of it, a 30-page report. Um, and last year, we published a, a kind of a, a brief policy forum summary of, of what we concluded and what we recommended. Uh, by coincidence, and I didn't know this was coming, just in the same month in science, uh, uh, other authors published this paper on the human impact eroding chimpanzee behavioural diversity. Uh, and from all I've said, you'll guess that behavioural diversity is, is inferred much to be uh, cultural. And they came up with some similar recommendations independently to those uh, suggested in this paper here. So that's ongoing and there's, there's even been a recent meeting, a conference of the parties in India, uh, a United Nations meeting, which has actually started to put some of this work into practice. So um, that's be done with my talk. Uh, and as I said, I'll just show a few slides to then link this to our online teaching module, which is part of this series. Um, oh, yes, I have this intermediate slide. I mean, <clears throat> as Pete said, I've been doing this for 20 or 30 years. So a lot of collaborators, a lot of co-authors, thanks to all of them. They're not even all there. And thanks to our, our funders. Um, but here's uh, the, the, the homepage for our learning tutorial, as they're called, Animal Culture's Core Discoveries and New Horizons. Um, and we kick this off with three lectures. I give the introductory overview and there's some overlap with stuff I've, I've just been talking about, but it's not the same lecture by any means. Um, and uh, then we have two lectures introducing social learning, basically, which of course is fundamental to all culture. Alex Thornton, famous of his original studies on meerkat social learning and teaching. Uh, Rachel Kendall, uh, Cultural Evolution Society president who's written a wonderful review on these social learning strategies like um, conformity and, and copying dominant or, or, or successful individuals. And then we follow those three lectures with these ones, uh, each focusing on a, what we call a major study group, whereas you can see from what I've been saying, a lot of primates, cetaceans, birds, fish and insects. And then we finish off with five more lectures on, on particular topics. One is the, the vexed question of, well, is there any evidence for cumulative culture? Um, and Nico Cladia is a good person to talk on that. I expand more on what I just mentioned in pretty much one slide here, the implications for the evolution of human culture, which I should have said, I suppose, was the, at the most basic that human culture didn't spring out of the blue, I think we now know. Um, and then two of our authors wanted to say a bit more about ecology and evolution, um, and we, we ended up with these two titles. They somehow split this between them and, and have different emphases here, which are often quite in interestingly complementary and, and different. And then finally, dear old Carl Whitehead comes in as, as um, the person to talk about what I've just been mentioning, uh, the implications for conservation and also a bit 
for welfare too, practical implications. Um, so I think that really is me finished. Oh, except, no, okay, just one final little thing about um, technique. Um, I don't particularly like the way in which I'm, I'm delivering this lecture here, um, where, you know, I'm a little postage stamp off the side and there's just a disembodied PowerPoint slide uh, changing all the while. Um, and that's, uh, I'm preparing this, preferring this way of doing it in which I use the big TV screen for my lectures in, in the online module, uh, not because of um, so we're egotistically wanting to be bigger in the slide, but just, you know, I like to talk to my slides. I like to interact dynamically with my slides. Um, and in that uh, approach, I can do that. Unfortunately, I couldn't get access to the TV uh, today because of, uh, you can guess why, something to do with COVID, uh, I think they call it. Um, so, uh, but perhaps in future, that's what I'll be doing rather than this. Okay, so I think, yes, now I'm really done. Sergio. Thank you very much, Andy. This was a great story and great collection of in incredible facts. And we have a number of questions here. Um, and um, actually, the first one or is on uh, cumulative culture that, that you mentioned. The main difference between human and non-human culture seems to be the cumulative nature of the first. What would be the reason for that? Or is there a cumulative culture among non-human animals? So maybe yeah, you have this section of your course, but maybe you can briefly give. Yeah, it. yeah. As I say, uh, Nicola uh, Cladia uh, actually does one one whole session on that, and he's one of the people who have actually done ex experimental work on that. So I suppose the two sides of uh, the answer to that question. Um, I, I think. Uh, I mean, it has been apparently the case for a long time that uh, cumulative culture was unique to humans. So that was, as it were, the final frontier. Although there are a few little things like language I think, makes a difference as well. Um, but uh, in recent years, there have been a variety of studies um, uh, in, impacting on this, let's say. Um, and I think I, I, I might have a slide if I, I whiz down to the bottom here. Where are we? Yeah, this one. Um, I, I won't blow it up. Um, so here we've got a study from the wild. Um, uh, again, perhaps have a surprising candidate for, for cumulative culture because there's been some debate about, well, maybe apes have some forms of cumulative culture. Um, and, and I think uh, they do. But what they're talking about here is these, these bighorn sheep uh, that um, decades ago, sometimes, I mean, they have data going back two centuries uh, were extirpated in, in various regions in the USA, but then they were reintroduced. And the, these remain very sedentary to begin with. Um, but then over the years, they started doing what's called um, green wave surfing in the spring. It's a form of sort of short term or short distance migration in which they gradually track the good pasture up the mountains. Um, and um, in this slide, um, <clears throat> what they've shown is that over decades and over generations, um, the percentage migratory goes, goes up in this way. And the top diagram here shows the rising, what they're calling surfing knowledge. And this is the capacity of these animals to hit, as it were, optimal pasture at, at the right time or, you know, at the optimal Time. So that skill seems to accumulate. And so their speculation um, is that this really must be happening through some kind of cumulative process. Perhaps in each generation, individuals explore a bit further and get a bit better at that. But that accumulated knowledge up to that point then uh, gets transferred onto uh, other individuals, uh, on, onto the next generation. Um, oops. Um, so that, that's an example from the wild and I suspect you know that kind of process uh, doesn't require a, a lot of sort of really fancy sophisticated social learning I think um, and therefore it, it might be quite common and the same kind of thing might be going on 
um, in, in things like learning of learning tool use, uh, in, in, in other words, in a quite different context. So that's from the wild. And then there have been experiments, a number of experiments, but only a handful demonstrating this cumulative process. And again, they come from some surprising uh, areas such as pigeon navigation or pigeon homing, um, where uh, Sasaki and Biro, for example, showed that some pigeons homing together and they could map their, their routes very well. Um, if they then replaced one in, in a kind of diffusion divide, uh, design with a naive one and then flew them again, and they kept doing that so that after a few generations, as it were, these were totally different pigeons from the original set. Nevertheless, the routes got more and more accurate and direct, um, which again allowed them to have cumulative culture uh, cumulative cultural transmission was it you know in their title in a referee journal so we got some observation on some experimental evidence and I think you know that's one thing to explore um, nevertheless of course you know our cumulative culture goes way beyond uh, this you know no one's disputing the gulf that exists here why um, well I think I can't really give an, I can't give a short answer to that for sure. Uh, there's a lot of people writing uh, things like whole books, like you know, Joe Henrik and, and um, my colleague Kevin Leyland ab about this. Um, the dominant view, I think, has been it's something to do with our social learning, and that you know we have a high fidelity social learning system, which maintains traditions in place. Um, until some innovation happens. And then in Mike Tomasello's words, another major author on this, uh, things, things ratchet up. Um, I, I've questioned this for, for quite some time now, insofar as I think, you know, the, the other element, the other essential element to cumulative culture is innovation. And it could have been uh, innovatory capacity, given all I, I, my groups shown about social learning. I think the innovation uh, might have to have been an, a more important or an equally important component. Um, but um, other social cognitive abilities too. The problem I think we've got is that we've got an N of one. Um, you know, if you want to assess, as people have done, like in respect of Machiavellian intelligence, you know, does uh, social complexity, as in group size, predict uh, social intelligence or brain size? Well, we can look at 100 different primates and, and show that. Uh, here, um, we've just got one species and we're different in so many respects, you know, um, we've got language, uh, etc. And um, so it's actually very difficult to tease out uh, any kind of silver bullet that explains, you know, why we've got this cumulative capacity. Um, but okay, I, I've, I've blundered on around that for, for long enough, I think. Okay, thank you. Um, there is a question about uh, chimpanzee experiments. Does in-group, out-group effect uh, play any role in uh, cultural diffusion? In-group, out-group. Um, well, um, yeah, you, you might think that, um, I mean, wild chimpanzees, and they're again different from bonobos, but wild, wild chimpanzees are very antagonistic to, to local communities. So, um, uh, you know, there's not, not that much prospect for sort of a di direct communication between them and, and cultural transmission, except that, of course, as in the, uh, the little vervet monkeys I was talking about, it is typical for, for primates for one, one sex or another, sometimes both, but one sex or another to, to disperse when they become sexually mature. And in great apes, in Greek chimpanzees, that's typically the females. And uh, there have been some studies well, I'll mention one by Lydia Luntz, part of the Christoph Bush group, studying those nutcracking chimpanzees. Um, they found that um, they, they compared three groups of, of uh, three neighboring communities of chimpanzees who all nutcrack. But again, uh, as, as in another example I mentioned earlier on, they vary in actually how they do it, even amongst these neighboring groups who are pretty much in the same habitat. And of course, you know, genetically not, not that different. And one of them, uh, for example, cracks nuts using stone hammers right throughout the year, whereas others change between stone and wood according to how, how hard the nuts are. Well, what they found was that when females, uh, with the females who, who have uh, immigrated into groups, they follow the local norm, as it were, if we can put it that way, they do what the locals do. 
So again, we perhaps seem to have some instance of uh, when in Rome do as the Romans do. Um, and really to, to establish that needs more females to actually be followed, you know, as, as they transfer groups. Um, but I don't know if that's the kind of thing that that question was really asking about, um, but we do have evidence from that. I think the, the really interesting question there is, um, what explains the difference? What throws the switch? Because you could, you know, two things may happen as, as one individual goes into a different group. They may take their cultural knowledge with them so that then it, it spreads into the group, or they could instead conform to what the local uh, culture is. And so there won't be that much spread. Um, and we know, you know, there's, there's both these processes can be in play. We have independent evidence that both things can happen. But what, what decides when one happens um, versus the other? I think that's one still, to me, one big question, interesting question for the future. Thank you. Um, there is um, a long question here. Um, and I think the essence is uh, more about the definition. So uh, the way you discussed uh, culture, it seemed to be equivalent with social learning. Uh, but what about uh, social norms, rituals, symbols, and, uh, and, and things, things like that? Uh, yeah, okay. Well, first of all... Um, I guess to what extent the word culture is applicable? Yeah, okay. Well, um, I think one, one important point is that um, not all social learning is culture, but culture depends on social learning. Social learning is essential for culture. Um, but a lot of the things we see socially learned in animals may be quite uh, temporary and transient. So, for example, uh, bees, we know bees will watch other bees and bees will learn from those first bees, you know, what is good flowers bed uh, to go to. Um, but that information is only sort of useful for a few days. Um, and so that's not even likely to become a tradition or a culture. So um, I draw the distinction there. Social learning is, is really just learning from others. It's kind of building block for then traditions and traditions are um, behaviors or perhaps other other um, other elements like artifacts like tools and so on uh, that are um, uh, distinctive of a particular of a social group and that is the case because they have spread through social learning and perhaps are maintained through social learning they may be uh, maintained over generations and be long-term traditions of that kind. Um, in the field of animal culture, I would say culture itself is defined in different ways as it is you know, across the board, really, as we know. Um, but uh, one set of authors tends to simply equate culture with tradition. So you know, if, if, there's, if there's a tradition, they're gonna talk about culture. Um, but others have suggested, well, it might be worthwhile making culture do a bit more work um, and Carol von Schaik and I suggested one uh, approach to that, which was kind of indica indicated in when I was talking about our experiments, that cultures could be used to describe multiple traditions, um, as we think we find in the great apes, but increasingly perhaps in, in other species too. Um, so those are some of the distinctions I would make. Um, but when I was talking about the evolution of culture in great apes a moment ago, and you remember I had that, that big diagram with three kind of blocks of, of comparisons I was making. One was in the forms of social learning, but one was uh, down at the bottom was the content of behavior. And perhaps that's what relates to some of the things that your questioner just asked about um, symbols or, or whatever. I mean, so we can put things you know, in the human category there like religion, which I think we don't see in, in other species. Many, many of the differences between human and animal culture are in the actual contents uh, of our culture uh, as opposed to the underlying social learning mechanisms. There's been a concentrate on social learning mechanisms, I think, because of what I was saying in relation to a previous question, uh, that one of the major dominant hypotheses, and indeed, you know, working conclusions of many people, is that social learning provides the key to, to what's distinctive about human cumulative culture. Um, personally, I don't think it's that 
in quotes, simple. There's great, well, I think it's great, interesting uh, for people who are interested in that, that issue, take a, a look at a recent um, behavioral and brain sciences paper by Osurik and, and Reino, in which they rather rail against this, this uh, social learning explains all. Um, uh, but, but that's controversial, like all BBS papers. <laughs> Uh, there is now a somewhat related question on, on social norms. Is there any evidence of social norms in the sense of behavior stabilized by enforcement uh, in non-human okay. animals? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I've, I've talked about um, cult cultural transmission being influenced by local norms. Um, but I think one needs to make a, a, a major distinction between statistical norms what's most common in a group. Um, and I've, I've written another review in the last couple of years on, on that, on, on conformity. Um, and I think there's quite a lot of evidence for conformity to norms in the statistical sense. Um, but in the sense of uh, so we're prescriptive norms, this is what you should do. There, I think um, there seems to be a big difference. I, I haven't really come across any evidence that's compelling to me um, that there are prescriptive norms where animals are, say, you know, punished for not doing what what is is the local um, is the local norm. Um, I'm just trying to remember now. Um, hmm. Yeah, there's some recent experiments. Perhaps it's the one by Dan some by Daniel Hound. Um, Hmm. Well, if that person wants to email me, uh, there's something kind of um, on the tip of my tongue or on the tip of my brain, uh, which is more relevant, isn't it? just quite quite coming coming to hand. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, several uh, panelists here, and these are people who are speakers in this series. So let me ask our panelists if we have any questions or comments. Uh, if you have, yeah, please unmute yourself and uh, show the video. Joe, maybe you want to mention, uh, say a few words about your next week. Yeah, sure. I, well, uh, yeah, thank. I, I don't have a question for Andy, but that was a, a great, a great talk. Um, so yeah, and I'll be hosting next week. Something quite different, and I think, um, I think I'm safe to say it's a uniquely human cultural tradition. Uh, but I'll be talking about narratives and storytelling and cultural evolution in terms of that but particularly uh, folk narratives, thinking about both traditional ones like fairy tales and perhaps more contemporary ones like urban legends and conspiracy theories, and particularly how um, content biases, so cognitive biases for certain types of content have shaped the cultural evolution of those uh, different types of narratives. So that'll be next week. But thanks very much, Andy, for a great talk. Okay, okay. thanks. Yeah, uh, and we have, uh, yeah, I, I think we have a question, uh, time for just one more uh, question, and it's about uh, do traditions come in packages, or they each uh, are, or each of them is independent from ours? Hmm. Um, I don't. I don't think there's there's there's, there's a way big and compelling evidence for um, packages. Um, and I know, I think that that's still a controversy um, in the human field. I remember Pete Richardson and, and co uh, writing about that in one of those books um, that uh, they, they were in, involved in. Um, you know, are, are there really packages in the human uh, cult cultural transmission field or, or have we really got just lots of memes, um, smaller memes? Um, yeah, the study I often refer to uh, here kind of indicates something a bit like this maybe is a study by Thibaut Gruber, um, who worked on chimpanzees um, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, Uganda, in the Ugandan Badongo forest and, and so on, um, where he looked at one com community, which is an unusual community of, of chimpanzees who don't use stick tools, quite weird, um, and another community who does use stick tools, and he's one of the few who successfully 
done field experiments with chimpanzees. So he, he drilled holes in a log and filled them with honey so that uh, you could get a little bit out with your finger, but really you needed, what you needed was a stick tool to dip into that honey and pull the honey out. Seems fairly obvious to us. Um, and he presented this to both, both communities and <clears throat> the community that you typically use sticks uh, went and fetched sticks, of course, and, and dipped them in and, and got the honey. Uh, but the other community who do have some tool use, for example, they, they, they masticate leaves and make uh, sponges to, to get water out of the bowls of trees. They went and got the leaves and made those tools and tried to use those, which of course were really ineffective. Uh, but it seems you'd think to be staring in the face, you know, get a, go and get a stick. And in fact, he did later experiments in which he actually provided sticks and sticks with leaves on. And the chimps who used sticks went and got those and then efficiently peeled off the leaves and got a good stick to use as a tool. But the ones, the other ones, went and threw away the sticks and just made the leaves into, into one, one of these sponges, which didn't, didn't work very well. And so their argument was that um, the chimpanzees have a, have a very kind of focused uh, view on, on their, their cultures that, that's really limiting their ability to apply it to uh, other, what you might think would be, you know, closely related uh, domains. Yeah, well, I, I just mentioned that. I'm not sure it really ta tackles, tackles the question, but uh, perhaps that's because no nothing uh, does any better. <laughs> okay, yeah, we have uh, many more questions, but we probably should stop now. Uh, but it's been great. Uh, the questions actually will be on the website together with the video and uh, with uh, the PowerPoint, I believe. So thank you very much, Andy. It's been great. Really appreciate it. And I'm sure everybody has been enjoying it.